Let's go over to our man, Mr. Dave Mazza. Dave is the managing director, head of product at Direction. And you can check out Direction, and it's spelled D-I-R-E-X-I-O-N.com. Of course, you can be right on our webpage at TFNN. Just hit the Direction banner. Dave Mazza, welcome back to TFNN. Hey, thanks for having me back. I'm telling you, man. I, I love that you're on today. So... I want to talk about the ETF conference you were at last week, but what I'd like to yes. talk about first is that, so China's closed, right? Uh, we're getting calls in here last Thursday and Friday, and it was so cool that the audience was picking up on this so quick, right? So yeah. let me ask you something. And the calls were about Chad and then yin and yang, okay? So can we start with Chad, right? Because what happens, folks, is that, that, you know, just go to the website. You can see how these work. And what I was trying to figure out, and they were, they were, they were buying it because they felt that, okay, the market's down, you know, what is the correlation? And when you, we look at Chad, now the markets are closed in China, right? How do you guys turn around and say, it, it, it almost, when I was looking at the trading, it was almost like the option market that there were so many people in it that it stayed like where it was supposed to open this morning. But like, how did that happen? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, no, uh, it, exactly. One of the most interesting, but in the weeds components about ETFs in general, and then that becomes even more important when we're talking about leveraging ETFs, yes. is that the term is uh, price discovery. And ETFs uh, are actually able, in some cases, to lead price discovery in markets that are closed. And this really was exemplified last week. It was. So we know the A-share market, um, which is just local Chinese companies in yeah. Ch uh, Shanghai and Shenzhen, yes. were closed. But to your point, our ETF was actually uh, tracking very well where the implied price would have been. And what does implied price mean? It means... Uh, we can look at other markets that are related um, to China. Yes. Uh, so those would be Hong Kong shares or H shares. Those are Chinese companies that trade in Hong Kong and then do a conversion for the currency. And last week, um, uh, by and large, ETF, ETFs, I'll use the term, traded beautifully, meaning that they traded in expectation of where markets would open. Um, so we actually saw the local market catch up, if, if you will, yes. to where ETFs were pricing. Um, the fact that uh, markets would open down uh, in local China locally pretty significantly. And, and folks, uh, you know, if you're looking for the symbol, th this is so impressive, it's amazing. So if you're looking for the symbols, and these are the ones I'm familiar with because we got the calls in last week, you have a one-to-one, -one, which is CHAD, and that the CHAD, I believe, is a CS, is a 300, right? Correct, yes. yes. And then, then you have the triple, okay, which is the yin, Y-I-N-N, -N, and the yang, Y-N-G, which is based off a, a different indice, but I love how you do it, meaning the weighting structures, right, that, that's inside um, the China bull and, and bear, three times shares. Pretty yeah, correct. So, so let's talk about the Chinese equity market uh, in the weeds for a second here. Yes. So historically, most U.S. investors, in fact, most uh, non-local Chinese investors were only able to access Chinese companies listed in foreign markets, most of them listed in Hong Kong. But of course, we know Chinese companies list in New York or they can list in London. Yes. Um, so yin and yang are focused on the largest Chinese companies that trade in Hong Kong. Uh, now, uh, Chad and Chow, uh, those are focused on the CSI 300. So that's what's known as China A shares. Okay. So those are those are the largest Chinese companies, 300 of them in fact, that are traded locally in China. I see it. I like it, man. Pretty amazing, I'll tell you. And you know, and everyone, of course, is always looking for an edge. Uh, you know, and so when it happened, I, I was used to the yin and yang. I, I hadn't been used to the Chad, but I'm, I'm glad people caught on to it. They caught on pretty quick, man, which I thought was pretty pretty cool in general. Yeah. Meaning the education value of the CTF structure in general, I think, has gone up dramatically. Um, so if we can switch gears, I know last Monday, I mean, I, I believe that's one of the biggest ETF conferences in the world that you were at, right? Correct, yes. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, the changes that are happening in the ETF market? Um, you know, I, I, my understanding is that regulation-wise, we got a lot of changes that are happening, right? Yeah, so I think the biggest takeaway for most attendees of the conference, especially those that have been there 
uh, for uh, many years like ourselves is that we saw a lot of unfamiliar faces. And, and all that means by that is that a lot of traditional active managers uh, were at this conference because nice. uh, most recently the SEC has approved a modification of the ETF structure for something new. And these would be called um, non-transparent ETFs. So meaning an active manager who may not want to show their holdings and uh, uh, because they believe that, of course, they have an edge or that they want to be selecting securities uh, without uh, alerting the, the, the marketplace about this, could launch ETFs that only disclose their holdings on a less frequent basis than ETFs have to do now, which is daily. So this is a pretty interesting development where we're going to see a lot of new launches um, from your traditional active managers. Now, of course, listeners on the phone, time will tell if these catch on. Yes. Um, but it's going to be a big trend that we see in 2020. Now, now Dave, when I, I read about how this is going to work, folks, and this is really intriguing, and I don't know enough about the mutual fund market, is, are they going to have to disclose what's in there like once a quarter or once six months? Is there, is there a number at this point that they're going to have to disclose what's inside them? Correct. So here's what's different is um, like tr uh, traditional mutual funds disclose their holdings on a quarterly basis with a lag. Okay. That's the same the with this structure. $45 lag. Uh, yeah, 45 Exactly. Cents, yeah. But what's different is that uh, some of the structures will allow um, fund managers to have a proxy, meaning that they select a certain um, number of securities that would be in their holdings to use um, uh, to publish to the market on a daily basis. Okay. Other structures are almost completely untransparent. Uh, where you wouldn't have a lot of insight into what the fund manager is holding. So this really comes down to um, the idea that the ETF structure uh, is beneficial relative to the mutual fund. And now that's debatable. Um, but the idea is that the ETF structure, it's a lot cleaner. There's no 12B1 fees or transfer agent fees. So maybe that if we believe active management is finally coming back, people will, as they continue to put more and more ETFs in their portfolio, they'll want an ETF vehicle for active management. Interesting, man. It would seem that, like, it's really hard for me to wrap my head around that I'm buying something and I don't know what's inside the ETF. <laughs> Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, exactly, which is why, um, you know, here at Direction, we're obviously paying attention um, to this. Uh, we don't have any plans to rush into that space. Our heritage isn't in active management anyway. Uh, there's a big debate if these are going to be, you know, the next big thing yes. or if they're going to be a flop, frankly. Um, right. In my opinion, they're going to, I don't know exactly where that's going to be, but it's going to be one or the other. I don't think you see a middle ground with approaches like this. Either uh, uh, people say, hey, actually, yeah, I, I still believe in active management in certain asset classes, sure. but I like the ETF vehicle because I can trade it intraday. There's some tax efficiencies. Or people are going to say, you know what? I like the control that ETFs have in my portfolio because they're passive, because they give me access to all new different markets and different sectors. And I like that either my advisor get, uh, can build me a more robust portfolio or I can do it myself. So I don't necessarily need an active manager to do so. So we will see. Uh, that's a, we'll that's a great attention. point, man. No, because I, I, you know what? I can see what you're talking about because there's plenty of people that have mutual funds that would like to get in and out of them every day, whether it's an IRA or true. anything else. Interesting, man. Well, Dave, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for the education, especially uh, the China deal in a huge way. Look forward to speaking to you again. Talk soon. Thank you. Stay right there, folks. Come right back.